to talk about uh, mm. the motivations for this gap labeling conjecture. So I feel uh, I put on a little bit of my a physics hat because uh, I feel a good conjecture is almost as good as a theorem. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> and I'm convinced this is a good conjecture. <laughs> Although uh, Dennis was trying to give a counterexample when he talked to <laughs> Adelaide. So this, there's the, and then actually talk about the conjecture, it takes a little while to set it up. And then some uh, evidence about, uh, and the main result is the proof in 3D. So let me just start off. Uh, so you take Euclidean space, RB, with the standard flat metric. And magnetic field B, uh, so this is the physics terminology, there's a constant skew-symmetric matrix theta, it's D cross B, <clears throat> and you form this differential form, uh, two form, and it's uh, written in a compact notation, it's half dx transpose theta dx. Okay, so I'll use that notation. Uh, <clears throat> and then... Sorry? Mean. No, you take a vector of uh, which is dx1, dx2, dx3, and this uh, transpose of the vector, and this is matrix multiplication. Mm -hmm. okay. oh. And b is closed because theta is constant. Okay. So <laughs> your closed form on a contractible space, it's exact. So you can pick a one form either. So it's a d equals b. This is uh, sometimes called a uh, vector potential in physics. And you can uh, regard eta as defining a connection, nabla, which is d plus i eta, on the trivial complex line bundle over the Euclidean space. So this seems like an overkill, but this is a good to remember the geometric context. The curvature is i b. B and physically, it is the electromagnetic vector potential for the uniform magnetic field B, normal to RB. And then, <laughs> using the Ramanian metric, uh, you can form a Hamiltonian for an electron in this magnetic field, and this is... Wait, so uh, D is 3 is space, and then time is orthogonal? Yeah. Orthogonal. Well, think of two dimensions, then you can actually visualize it. Yeah, it's okay. normal to the, the plane. So D was... Take D equals 2? Yeah, just, just for argument's sake. That's a physical uh, situation, usually. You take a plane... Uh, I'll, I'll tell you where it arises in the... Um, you you usually in two. Hmm? Can you say something about D being orthogonal? Yeah, it's normal to the plane of uh, dx dy. Oh, oh, yeah. oh that orthogonal. Yeah, okay. that. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's it's just uh, you form the connection, the adjoint of the connection times connection. This is sometimes called Bachmann Laplacian, mm -hmm. and plus potential B, and V is a smooth real valued bounded function. Okay, so, so this Hamiltonian is self-adjoint and bounded below. So I'm told there are plenty of analysts here, so <laughs> I hope this is... Uh... <clears throat> so the restriction of H to... Uh, so uh, what, I'll, what I'd like to understand is the spectrum of this uh, operator. <clears throat> uh, and somehow uh, the spectrum can be uh, continuous and it's complicated. So there's a, this is a way to analyze it. And you restrict H, this operator H, to a bounded domain. In bounded domains, uh, and if self-adjoint boundary conditions, this self-adjoint operator, and it's got nice uh, discrete spectrum. Okay, so you can take any uh, self-adjoint boundary conditions. And <clears throat> it's got an unbounded, purely discrete spectrum. And it's bounded below and of course unbounded <coughs> above. And the eigenvalues all have finite mul multiplicity. Okay, so this is the situation. Found below because B is bounded? Yeah, the Hamiltonian is bounded below. The first term is positive. The first term is positive, term is positive. Yeah, and V is bounded below. Okay. So therefore, the whole operator is bounded below. Uh, so the <coughs> now you can define the counting function, which is the number of eigenvalues less than or equal to lambda. 
Okay, so this is uh, N of lambda. So it's also the trace of the spectral projection of this Hamiltonian. Right? So, uh, the characteristic function from minus infinity to lambda. So that's a spectral projection of the Hamiltonian. This is, uh, in some sense, this is extremely boring. And I mean, it seems like an old kill, because this is just a step function. And the values are just uh, integers. Right? I mean, uh, they are <coughs> uh, just some uh, positive integers. Right? It's the number of eigenvalues less than lambda. And the value of this uh, counting function on a gap is called the gap label. Okay. So, and the properties of the counting function is it's non-decreasing. It's uh, zero for lambda less than the bottom of the spectrum. These are all obvious, and this is uh, somewhat not obvious. This is the wild law. So as lambda tends to infinity, you have a certain growth rate, and n of lambda is constant spectral gaps. So it just looks like this. So it's like one, three, four. These are the gap labels. <coughs> So totally boring for this uh, function. But what we'd like to have is a counting function for the Hamiltonian on Euclidean space. So <clears throat> this is strictly def defined because of the continuous spectrum. So this is, uh, came up in physics. Uh, it's called the integrated right. density of states. If v were zero, it would be that. We had it discrete before. Sorry, if v was Isn't zero. That h the same as the h you had before. Yeah, the first h if which. If v is zero, then it's equal to that. And it's not discrete. It's so right. it's it's discrete. Not discrete. No, it's not discrete. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to give an approximation by discrete. Oh, on the bounded domain. Yes. Discrete. Oh, on R D of both yes. bounded domains. That's right. right. Okay. And this is an approximation of. Mm -hmm. uh, so you take the uh, discrete spectrum Hamiltonian, and you divide out by the volume, right? of that domain and take uh, exhaustion of uh, the Euclidean space. So there is a kind of uh, general reason for why this works, and this is because Rd is a, Euclidean space is amenable. Right? And this is a formal sequence. So if you take balls, that'll do. You know. And the properties of this integrated density of states, by the way, this is studied in physics a long time ago. I mean, way before mathematicians considered it. So <clears throat> this is, uh, so I'll uh, shorten it to IDS. So th now the function is non-decreasing, uh, but, uh, and it's, it, well, it's got the similar properties as the one mm -hmm. for on the bounded domain. But let me just point out that this is actually far more uh, involved. So it looks like this, a very interesting, the gap labels are extremely interesting. It can be sometimes even a dense set on the uh, y-axis, I mean, those are the gap labels. And the labels are no longer integers. They're not integers, yeah. that's why I said they're interesting, <laughs> no, no longer integers. They can be dense, right? Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, okay. However, I mean, it is hard to work with this integrated density of states. So I'm going to give another uh, sort of description, which is easier to work with, but sadly a little bit complicated. I hope uh, this is uh, not too bad. So now <clears throat> there's a lattice, uh, which is uh, ZD, right, uh, acting on uh, on Euclidean space, <clears throat> and let u of gamma, gamma is an element in the lattice, denote the unitary operator given by translation. Okay. So now look at this set, sigma 0 of z. So what, what is it? You take the uh, z is, uh, sorry, I didn't say that, but oh, yeah. yeah. So z is in the imaginary. Uh, it has non-zero imaginary components, so it's in the resolvent, right? And this is the resolvent operator, which is a bounded operator, and I translate it by conjugating it by this uh, unitary for each gamma inside the lattice. So <clears throat> the assumption is that this set is pre-compact. Okay. 
So let's see whether it's reasonable. If uh, the potential V was actually uh, periodic, then this would be a point, I claim. And it's compact. So this measures some aperiodicity of the uh, operator, which is essentially the potential. And, and it's the case, it turns out, for any bounded smooth function that this set is compact. Okay? So the potential is smooth. For instance, if it's smooth and periodic, then it's just a point. And it's not compact with non smooth function? Well, or non-bounded, huh? non-bounded, yeah. I don't work with non-smooth, <laughs> sorry. Only, only smooth functions for me, it's geometry. All right, so <clears throat> this is a subset of the uh, bounded operators, right? So I take the strong closure, okay? So <clears throat> I call that sigma, and it's a compact set because the other one was assumed to be pre-compact. It turns out to be independent of Z, so long as the imaginary part of Z is not zero. Right? So, <clears throat> uh, modulo some homeomorphism. And this is called the disorder set of how, and the lattice acts on sigma by homeomorphisms, just by the way it's defined. Okay? So the most interesting case is uh, actually Let's not say the most interesting. The case of interest for this lecture <laughs> is when uh, sigma is a counter set. So this occurs when you have aperiodic tilings, for instance. <laughs> and so in this case, uh, ZD acts minimally on sigma, that is, uh, it's got a dense orbit. And since uh, the lattice ZD is a uh, amenable group, you always have an invariant uh, probability measure on sigma. You mean it has one dense orbit? Yeah, it has just a uh, dense orbit. The orbit through one point is dense. Yeah. What? Yeah, the orbit through one point is dense. I can't understand the logical sense. It's, it's you mean minimal. Orbit is denser, there is one orbit. There's at least one orbit which is dense. There's at least one orbit which is dense. Okay. Yeah. So let mu be the invariant <coughs> probability measure. So now uh, I'll introduce some uh, structure, which is uh, a co-cycle on the lattice. It's a U1 valued co-cycle, so circle valued co-cycle. So it's, uh, that means it satisfies this identity. Uh, sigma of gamma 1, gamma 2, sigma of gamma 1 plus gamma 2, gamma 3 is equal to, you just put, <coughs> not too hard to re remember. <laughs> so this is the cocycle identity. And the reason why the cocycle comes in is because of the magnetic field. The magnetic, if there was no magnetic field, you don't have to worry about this. But uh, the two form actually determines a co two cocycle. Okay. The uh, twisted cross product algebra, so this is uh, continuous functions on sigma, cross the values product. are where? Hmm? Sigma? sigma takes sigma. values in the circle. Ah. Right. So um, maybe one uh, for Dennis, this might help. So B uh, is a, uh, well, de determines a two class on uh, <clears throat> on the torus. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. So you can uh, exponentiate it, and it determines a two class on the torus with coefficients in u one. Right. And now, this, uh, if you use the Alan Murray McLean uh, tic tac toe argument, you get this is the same as H2 of uh, ZD with values in U1. Okay. So you can actually, from the magnetic field following the tic tac toe argument or the Alan Murray McLean map, you get a two cycle with values in U1. Okay. 
Yeah, I've hidden that, but that's how it works. So now, so what's the twisted cross product algebra? So the elements are uh, continuous functions with compact support on sigma cross Zd. Right? Sigma is the counter set, Zd is the lattice. So just take compactly supported functions. So I need to define the product. The product is a convolution product if it wasn't for the sigma. And the sigma gives a twist to the convolution product. The adjoint is also <laughs> the usual adjoint on the group algebra, but you have to throw in the sigma uh, to make it work. And <clears throat> you have a regular rep representation. It's the same as taking the product, convolution product. And then you have a norm. And the twisted cross product is the closure on, of this uh, algebra in the non topology. So, this is uh, the complicated bit. <laughs> so, uh, so, now this algebra, cross product algebra, has a trace which is determined by the measure. So, the invariant measure determines a trace on the twisted cross product algebra. So you take an element A, it's a function on sigma cross Zd, evaluate it at zero, right, and integrate over sigma. Okay, so that's, uh, it's very analogous to the group algebra, you know, so, and the trace on the group algebra. So <coughs> for AB, and it's an actual trace, that's the trace of AB is trace of BA, and if A is non-negative, then the trace is also non-negative. So, although I just want to point out that although it defined it on continuous functions, which are uh, this continuous function cross product Zd, it actually is well-defined on L-infinity functions on the Cantor set with uh, respect to the measure mu and uh, cross product Zd, because you can just uh, do this uh, this makes sense. The trace makes sense in that. Because of the positivity. Yeah. Right. And it's, yeah. Uh, it's, it's like a measure. It's yeah. by a linear function or continuous function, which is right. used to find an opportunity to measure. Exactly. So, so, yeah. So the, it's, it's definitely a positive trace. I mean, I like this because you explained to me well, this mantra that I've heard for 30 years and I've understood how when one analysis is non non commutative measure theory. Yeah. I mean, and that seems to be the point. Yeah, that is the point, yeah, here. <laughs> <laughs> so now, um, the spectral projections of H, this is the operator on Euclidean space, uh, L2 of Euclidean space. <laughs> These are bounded measurable functions of H. So this characteristic function from minus infinity to lambda, that's a spectral projection, is in this uh, Bonoyan algebra, right? Just by fiat. <clears throat> and uh, one has the useful theorem due to Schumann many years ago. I tried to look up which year, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I must uh, apologize because he was a collaborator of mine. I should know. That. <laughs> but IDS has the following expression at any point of continuity. That is, uh, this uh, integrated density of states is equal to just the trace applied to the spectral projection of H. Okay, so great. It's a very simple expression, no limits. <laughs> so when lambda is in a spectral gap of H, then this projection is actually in the smaller algebra, which is continuous functions, considered uh, complex. Let me just give a one-line proof of it, although it, I realize it took a little more than one line. So suppose you have a spectral gap. Let me just draw, see the... So <laughs> supposing uh, AB is a spectral gap, right? And then this is the bottom of the spectrum. Right, of the operator, and then you take a contour, which encloses the left, right? And this is, uh, this is the famous Ries projection, representation of the projection. So this character's function from minus infinity to E, E is a point in the gap, or applied to H, is this uh, homomorphic function of H. And the homomorphic function is given by via the contour integral. <coughs> so it's actually, and um, this, uh, 
This algebra is closed under the continuous functional calculus, therefore this is actually in the, uh, the smaller algebra. Right. So, <coughs> it follows that the spectral gap labels of H are contained in the subgroup of the reals, which is the image of the, so, I mean, uh, I, I, and then I explain this, but I'll, maybe in the next slide I'm explaining it. So the K theory involves, uh, contains projections, right? And uh, the trace actually extends to K theory. I'll just explain it. Uh, and it's the image of this. So this is the, <clears throat> so the magnetic gap labeling is to understand what's the image of this in some other terms. Okay, so. That's not finally generated, it's just countable. Uh, it turns out it's finitely generated. Oh, but yes. Yeah, yeah. But in general, for C cell algebra, you can only say it's countable. That's all. Uh, you know, there are weird ones, uh, weird algebras, what is like the canonical anti commutation <coughs> relations. The K theory of that C cell algebra is actually not uh, finitely generated, but it's countable still. So the two project, two pro, so let me just uh, one uh, slide worth of the K theory. So, <laughs> so let P and Q be in the <coughs> projections in this uh, C star algebra A. So you want to, un sorry, it's in the, we want to understand the K theory of A. So what you look at is projections in A tensor compacts, right? So it's like large matrices over A. And two projections are more phenomenon equivalent if there's an element in actually A tends to K such that P is A star A and Q is A A star. Okay, so a typo, sorry, this is A tends to K. And the K theory of A is table equivalence classes of pairs P and Q, where P and Q are equivalent to P prime and Q prime, so stably equivalent. If P plus Q prime plus R is uh, isomorphic to P prime plus Q plus R for some projection in A tensor Q, K. So, uh, this is, and this is the K theory of A, it's a countable group. So why is it countable? Well, <laughs> yeah, um, let's see. It is, I know, but uh, I'll tell you the argument later. Let me not. Uh, uh, yeah, it, but uh, as opposed to like for Neumann algebra, for Neumann algebras, the projections don't uh, are not countably generated. K theory is uncountable in general for type two, uh, and there is a trace on this algebra. So the trace in the algebra induces the morphism on K theory because it's defined on projections, also. All right, now. Uh, I want to describe like the image of the trace. So it's another set of quantities I'm going to define. So, <clears throat> so I call this the magic formula. <laughs> so, so let lambda of dx be uh, the exterior algebra on dx1 to dxd, right? just like the generators of Rd. And, <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's got basis, the polynomials, the monomials, dxi, where i is a multi-index set, <coughs> a line between uh, of uh, a subset of length. <coughs> I got this wrong, by the way. It should be, uh, so i should be up to p. Up to what? Uh, instead of d, it should be p. Another typo here, <laughs> because the length of this uh, of is p. p. And this is also p. Um, and given the skew symmetric matrix theta, you can associate, I told you, this uh, two form, which is dx transpose theta dx, and it's an element here in the exterior algebra generated by dx1 to dx d. So, <clears throat> now, recall that the Fafian of the skew symmetric matrix, well, it's denoted by pf of theta. It can be defined as follows, invariantly. So you take uh, this uh, two form, 
raise it to the power m and divide by 1 over m factorial, and that's a multiple of the <coughs> volume form, dx1 to dxd, and uh, that multiple is the Fafian. And d is even, I'm taking for simplicity, otherwise it's zero. Mm -hmm. so. so the Fafian of a skew-symmetric matrix, nice way to teach your class. <laughs> so. Thank you, I never knew what it was. <laughs> So it's the square root of the Laplace of the determinant, but this is an, for skew symmetric matrices, there's a canonical square root. Okay, so here's a nice formula uh, way back in, uh, uh, in my thesis with my, uh, in my joint work with my supervisor. Uh, so e to the one half dx transpose theta dx it has a beautiful formula. It's exactly equal to the Fafian of submatrices of that skew symmetric matrix theta times dxi, this monomial dxi. And these are submatrices, uh, so i runs over subsets of 1 to d. Again, I made a mistake here. So. <laughs> With an even number of elements. Okay, so i has length as an even length. So this was used in a very different context uh, in that paper with Cohen uh, in understanding the Turnwell representative of the Tom class of a vector bundle. So it's used in spectral theory now. <laughs> you mentioned citation before. How many does that one count? <laughs> it's the one here? Yeah. I, I think over 100, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but they count only math citations. In physics, there are many more. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let me sketch the proof. So to verify this identity, you fix a multi-index capital I of even length and consider the subjective algebra homomorphism, which goes from the exterior algebra generated by dx1 to dxd to dx1 <clears throat> well, to all the dx's where j is in i, okay? So that's a subset. This, uh, this homomorphism just kills the components not containing, uh, <clears throat> which are not in i, okay, so. And in mod i, in degree mod i, this map kills all monomials except uh, dxi. And it maps the Gaussian expression on this side, which is e to the r half dx transpose theta dx, onto the corresponding Gaussian expression constructed from the submatrix theta i. So, uh, and thus the coefficient is just Fafian theta i. So, this is a small proof, but it was key to proving that Tom class. <laughs> so, once we saw this, it was all clear. All right. So now, uh, so I'm going to denote by z of mu uh, the subgroup of the real line, which is generated by measures of clopen sets, <coughs> closed and open sets of uh, sigma. Okay, so that's uh, given a notation. So <coughs> this is a countable set, as these clopen sets form a countable sets. Of and it's also given by the integral of integer valued functions on the counter set. Can I, can I make this comment? <laughs> you know, if you have a manifold and a probability measure on it that has charges every open set, then any two of those are related by homeomorphism. Mm -hmm. But on a counter set, which has a huge set of homeomorphisms, yeah. it preserves the open set, so it preserves the measures of all those open right. sets. So that's right. invariant, yeah. intrinsic invariant of the thing. So yes. it's basic in, yeah. in dynamics. Is you're saying it's coming up here. Yeah, it comes up in the conjecture. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> that's like the lowest level. Now, for each multi index, I'm going to define another set like it. So, 
and just uh, review uh, if uh, group gamma, and in this case it's just a lattice, <coughs> acts uh, on a module M, then the co-invariance of M are defined to be the quotient, the module divided by an element in M minus GM. Okay, so this, uh, those are the co-invariants. And the invariants of M are defined to be the set of all M, which uh, M is equal to GM for all G in gamma. Okay, so you have two, given a module and a group, of, for a group action, you can form two uh, other modules. So let R be an <coughs> ordered subset of one to D. Again, there's some type, oh, I don't know <laughs> what happened. So <coughs> with an even uh, set of elements, and I'm going to put this notation, C of six, so the integer value functions and the co-invariance. So the integer value functions in module for the gamma action. And uh, <clears throat> so these are the co-invariants under the subgroup, uh, ZIC of Z, Z uh, uh, it should be ZD, but. So, um, and, um, this is the co-invariance, and take the invariance on the zi. Okay, so so it's the in, so it's the invariance of the co-invariance, right? So and uh, so you look at the integrals of all these functions. So that's what uh, I denote by zi of mu. Okay, so. And this is the magnetic gap labeling conjecture. So, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, uh, I seem to have changed the D and P. I'm sorry about that. So, so P now is D. Uh, so, D is P and, uh, it's so the, the pardon? Just the one I gave you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yes, that's why I think that's it was. Why I was uh, <laughs> Oh, it's good. It's always telling us to, yeah. Typing up here now. Yeah. <laughs> so when uh, when it's even, right? When P is even, then it's uh, the this magnetic frequency group, right? This is supposed to be where <coughs> the right hand side. I mean, uh, so it's Z of mu plus uh, Z of mu is the uh, images of the Clopin sets under the measure, okay. and this is uh, uh, Z i of mu times the Fafian of theta i plus the Fafian of theta times z. And the term is simple, the last term is simple because of minimality. So I'll explain that. Yeah. And in odd, you don't get the last term because the Fafian is zero. Okay, so z i of, of, <coughs> of mu. That was the previous uh, page. That was that. Uh, is the measure yeah. or yeah the integrals yeah. of those functions which are invariant co-invariant. What does it mean the integral of a bunch of things like that? What does that mean? You take the set of all integrals. Just like z of mu is the integral of these functions, take the set of all integrals of integer valid functions. Oh, so this is invariant, you can go to the yeah. common variance. Yeah. Oh. So you take the set of all values of all integrals of that's right. Okay. It's a large set, but it's still countable. Okay. Yeah. okay, this is the magnetic frequency group, and the gap labeling says that this set, right, the gap labels, are contained in the magnetic frequency group. So that's the conjecture. <laughs> Wait, so it's the left hand side of these traces on the general? On K theory, yeah. Continuous, uh, yeah. probably continuous stuff. The right. Right-hand side is all these gaps plus some. Can you go back again? Thetas. Yeah. Yeah, these gap numbers times yeah. the Fafians. Of right. Theta L is uh, these sub matrices. Sure. Okay. So the last term is what's that? Just Fafian of theta times z. What's z? The integers. Yeah. Yeah, the integers. Uh, so it's uh, it's simple. I was explaining because of the minimality. That that side would be complicated if you didn't assume minimality. Also, so there's 
the plateaus of this graph you yeah. had before are contained yeah. in that set of real numbers. Exactly. Okay. I, <clears throat> So when theta was zero, is zero, so there's no magnetic field, then this, you won't have these terms, right? But this one, uh, <coughs> this is called, uh, this is Belisard's uh, conjecture. So he uh, conjectured it in uh, 1980. So there's this long history, which he asked us to include in our... What? Yet? Well, no. so I'll, I'll tell you that in a minute. This, oh. That's this page. Sorry. So he conjectured this actual equality. Uh, it's sort of clear that it should be contained in, but not clear that it should be equal. But let me just say that he proved it himself when the uh, dimension is 1, 2, and 3 with collaborators. And then uh, there, was a, there was a paper. Uh, maybe I shouldn't mention names, <laughs> which, which said, which claimed a certain result. And all these three groups of people, unfortunately, used Where are it. The groupings? Oh, right. So this is Bellisard. Uh, no, I don't oh, I see. So semicolons. Oh, two, right. two semicolons. Okay. Right. So this is one set. And then mm -hmm. my collaborator, mm -hmm. Ben Muir, and Oyoda. Oh, your collaborator. And then. Kamek and Putnam. Okay, so those are the three teams. So they all unfortunately use the same result. The what? They use this, uh, a result which uh, was in doubt afterwards. Ah, okay. <laughs> so so their, their papers are fine, but they relied on a result which is. Uh, which proved they didn't check. Well, they didn't check, honestly. <laughs> 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 so. So I feel a bit bad saying this, but uh, I don't know. Well, it's my clarity. So. so let me just point Is out. Is that paper in doubt wrong or just still in doubt? Uh, it, it's probably wrong. Oh. Yeah, but uh, the, it doesn't say much about the conjecture. It just, yeah. It was used by them to prove it, but uh, no, it's not clear that it's proved. So, so this, uh, let me just say, <coughs> Uh, about the existence of gaps. So this guy's, uh, so in 1D, it's well known that there are lots of gaps. Moser came up with a very beautiful description. Who? Uh, Jürgen Moser oh. came up with a beautiful description of the existence of how gaps open, etc. So a complete story is known in 1D. But in 2D, uh, fairly recently, Rykov and his collaborators considered a 2D magnetic Laplacian. So it's in uh, x and y variables, but the potential is only in the x variable, in half the variables. And it's periodic. And um, so it's known to have generically infinitely many open uh, spectral gaps. Okay. So this is not so exciting, by the way, you know, but it's something. Uh, because uh, the bit uh, beta. Beta's Sommerfeld conjecture, proved recently by this guy Panoski, says there are only a finite number of gaps in the spectrum of any Schrodinger operator or Euclidean space with smooth periodic potential. Okay, so it's a great uh, <laughs> sort of contrast. So, to the case when theta is non zero, And in fact, uh, this, uh, this team, uh, Rykov and collaborators, studied the Hamiltonian, the one which I wrote before, plus or minus some w, where w is an L infinity function on R2, which is smooth, actually. And it's a sort of Hamiltonian that we consider. They find that there are infinitely many discrete eigenvalues of this operator in any spectral spectral gap of uh, the original operator H. So in each spectral gap, there are infinitely many eigenvalues, which of course converge to the endpoints. Okay, so, so it says that, the, so the upshot is to say that there are lots of spectral gaps, even in 2D, not just in 1D. So this was actually much harder to prove than the 1D case. 
Um, Doesn't this contradict the previous statement? Which previous statement? Ganovsky, or whatever his name is. No, that was uh, without magnetic field. Oh, this is with magnetic field. With magnetic field. Oh. Non-zero magnetic field. Okay, so let me quickly give evidence for the conjecture in 2D. This is a very easy case. <laughs> so uh, we have the same situation. And in 2D, uh, uh, this uh, sigma determines a cohomology class which can be identified with a circle. So just uh, theta ranging from 0 to 1 where you take sigma to be e to the 2 pi i theta omega, where it <coughs> stands in like a form on z squared. So then the, actually it turns out that there's an equality. Uh, the range of trace is z of mu plus z theta. Okay. So let me just uh, give a, a sketch of the argument because it's so simple. So <laughs> it does use some c star algebraic stuff. So there's, uh, there's a quantum isomorphism uh, and an uh, interesting trick due to Pack and Rabin, which says that the K theory of this cross product algebra, twisted cross product algebra, is isomorphic to the K theory of a sort of commutative space. And the commutative space X is just the uh, Cantor set and the uh, Take the product, Cartesian product with Euclidean space, R squared, and divide by Z squared, where Z squared acts on R squared by the standard action, the lattice, and Z squared acts on sigma by the minimal action. Okay, so it's a fiber bundle or the torus, but with fiber, the uh, awful set, which is a counter set, right? So there is a, so we have a foliated. Uh, uh, a twisted version of uh, cons uh, foliated in measured index theorem. So, and it says that uh, the trace of the image of a vector bundle or size of a vector bundle or x, and mu theta is this map, it's a kind of index map. So you take the trace of this element and this is equal to uh, e to the theta dx1 raised dx2 which uh, turn character of psi and you integrate over x. Okay, so this is uh, the expression. So now one observation is that x is a connected space because z squared action is minimal. Okay, so this is point set topology. And, and therefore, uh, well, if you expand that uh, quantity here, the exponential, <coughs> you get uh, <coughs> theta mu of sigma, and the rank of psi actually is constant over, over x because x is connected. So it's a constant, it pulls out of the integration. And so you can use Fubini's theorem and integrate over sigma and integrate over torus, right? And you get theta times the rank of psi plus the first term class of psi. So this uh, first term class is what uh, these guys, Belisard, computed. That is a zero magnetic field case. So that is Z of mu, if any vary over all psi. And therefore you get the conjecture, you prove the conjecture in this case. Why? Because of, you get the C1 formula and the yeah. magnetic field, and then you're saying yeah. you so this it's given by the first term? Yeah, the Why first term. As you vary all psi, you get all integers, right? And here, this is what Belisar proved. <coughs> okay, so, so I'm using his theorem. So then we give another proof where we don't use this theorem, by the way, but it's longer. You're saying this follows from some, the index theorem for these laminated. Yeah, we proved an index theorem. I don't think I'll get to it. I was hoping to, but I think I won't have time. So, um, so we twist uh, Kahn's uh, uh, theorem. We have a twisted version of his theorem. Uh, this is another example. Maybe I'll skip it because it's... Uh, I already explained this example to you, so I'll skip. <laughs> so 
we also prove it uh, from the two-dimensional case. And if theta is in Jordan block form, right, canonical Jordan block form, then we prove it, uh, the theorem also in this case, using k-theoretic methods. So we use uh, essentially the Kuna theorem and the, two, the fact that it's true in 2D. Okay. So <clears throat> the evidence builds up. But here is where it's really compelling, I think, the evidence. So if we are v is periodic, that is, sigma is just a point, then uh, this cross product, just the cross product algebra is just the non commutative torus eta. Right? Uh, it's the chronic uh, foliation given by this angle theta. So if theta, <coughs> so I've gone back to D, I'm sorry. So if D is even, then uh, the range of the trace is this quantity. This looks exactly like the conjecture, right? And all right, so let's just prove it. Uh, <clears throat> so the reason why it's true in this case is there's, uh, there's this so-called uh, some kind of Bonkan conjecture, which is some twisted version of Bonkan conjecture. It uh, it says that this K theory of this non-commuted torus is the K theory of the torus, right? So and then <clears throat> an L2 index theorem, a twisted L2 index theorem, which approved in the 1990s, and uh, using that, uh, that identity, the magic formula, you get that the trace uh, of a mu theta of psi, the psi is a vector bundle on the torus, is one half the exponential of dx transpose theta dx, right? This wedge the term character, integrated of torus, and if you expand this out using that identity, you get the Fafian of theta i dx i wedge term character psi. So now this is uh, <clears throat> so I usually say that uh, you uh, the term character which is usually a rational isomorphism, well, it's integral on the torus. But since uh, I'm never going to finish my talk, I'll, I'll give the proof of that. So it's very, uh, so there is a reason here. Yeah. So, Usually, the term character is a map from K theory of uh, a space. So, in this case, the torus, it's known to be a rationalized morphism. So, if you tensor with Q, then it's an isomorphism. Right? This is well known, it's true for every sort of decent space. So, but in this case, I claim it's actually integral. Okay, so here's the index theory proof. So you take a <coughs> E, a vector bundle, over the torus, right? So and then <coughs> you take uh, your favorite operator, Dirac, see, on the torus, and you couple the Dirac operator with a connection on E, and you take the index, right? And this is... Uh, well, integral, typically a hat of the torus, but the torus is flat, so a hat is just one. So it's just the term character of E. And this implies that the top component of the term character of E is integral, right? Now, uh, what about the others? Well, you can say, supposing I take uh, <clears throat> so dxi with dxj. Right? Look at this uh, uh, two form. Well, it's the first term class of some line bundle, Lij, right? Because it's integral. So <clears throat> I'll take uh, the index now of uh, Dirac 
tensor, nulla E tensor connection on this Lij. Right? And this is, uh, uh, well, <coughs> integral of the torus of 1 times. Uh, so what, one thing is that uh, e to the first term class of Lij right, is equal to 1 plus uh, first term class of Lij, because the high order terms vanish. It's, uh, if you take powers of this, it's uh, zero. So <clears throat> this is equal to uh, so uh, one plus uh, C one of Lij times uh, well ten character of E, right? and so this is. The chain character D of E, the top chain character E plus, you get uh, integral of uh, dxi, where the dxj, and the, the <laughs> that component uh, ch of D minus two. So you know that this is an integer. You we saw that this is an integer. Therefore. The d minus 2 component is also an integer. And you can do a simple induction. Right? So it's actually integral. It's only true for tori and a few other manifolds. So this is a result of Elliot. Although he, uh, we give an index theory proof, which is not what he gave. He did uh, you know, a C-style algebraic proof. And, Expression, this is, I had an argument with him. He thought he, is, <laughs> he had written it this way. And I said, no, the paper, you, he didn't recognize the low order terms as Fafians. So <laughs> let me point out a key difficulty uh, here. And so we, uh, the way it's proved, I mean, the key problem is to show uh, uh, so we saw that the chain character is integral on the torus, but what we'd like to show is the chain character is integral on x, where x is the fiber bundle over the torus. The fiber is a zero-dimensional space, so it's sort of believable, but of course, uh, not, you know, this is where the difficulty is, and this is what those guys claimed they could prove, that it was integral. <laughs> so... Um, Uh, so it turns out that uh, using this foliated index theorem that we prove, uh, it suffices to show that these quantities are all uh, integral. The components of the chain character are integral. And uh, uh, so actually, uh, this, this is, is a topological fact. Right? I mean, you have a certain kind of foliation, cap, yeah. foliation yeah. of the torus. Yeah. And the overall K theory behaves yeah. like the torus. Right. Well, in, in terms of integrality. Yeah, in terms of integrality. Of assumptions on the foliage. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know how to do this. <laughs> so, let's get it. So, the main uh, theorem, which unfortunately I don't have time to <laughs> prove. Uh, sketch is that uh, the 3D case is also true. That's the main result in our paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, significantly harder, I can say. So, uh, now I, well, how much time do I have to stop at four, is it? Yeah. Uh, okay, so I won't get the proof. Uh, <laughs> let's say it's a bit long. <laughs> <laughs> And this is our foliation index theorem, uh, which, uh, yeah. Oh. Okay, I think I'll stop here. And, uh, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. thanks very much. the rest of this talk all about? You've stated the conjecture and you said... And I was going to give a sketch of proof. Oh, you're going to give me the proof? 3D. 3D, yeah. So, but 2D, you just... It's very simple, yeah. yeah. 
But 3D is just significantly yeah. harder. Mm -hmm. Dearly would like to know it for 4D, but it <laughs> seems impossible by this method anyway. So. Oh. Oh. What? Yeah, okay. <laughs> I have one more question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, about, uh, yeah. There are all these seminars at the Simon Center about condensed matter physics and uh, how does these how do these gaps relate to these new topological phases of matter and stuff? Uh, well is there a connection with that the story? There is a connection with the uh, integer and fractional quantum Hall effect, yeah. but not uh, to, to the, the other I mean, topological phases, it's different. Half the talks are about fractional quantum yeah, effect, yeah. and half are about these condensed. I mean, they're right. together. So there's a non-commutative approach to the, uh, to the uh, quantum Hall effect, uh, fractional Hall effect, and that uh, <clears throat> involves, uh, you know, you look at the, uh, uh, this goes right to the beginning, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, here. So, <laughs> it's, uh, you, you have this, I mean, I guess you know the physical setting. So, oh. so you have this plate, which is made out of, say, copper or something, and then you have a uh, potential difference, and you have a current flowing in this direction. You said you have some resistance, you said? No, just a copper plate, yeah. so it's a conducting plate. And then if you have a magnetic field, then you have transfers, sort of uh, currents. And um, at zero degrees temperature, the, there is an amazing uh, sort of quantization of the conductance. So the conductance gets quantized. So it could go down also, but... So, so it has plateaus, like the other yeah, thing. it's got these plateaus, and it's very precise. So it's an uh, integer multiple of the fine structure constant, and you can add impurities to the material, and it still is robust on the adding impurities. So it became uh, like the standard for measuring the fine structure constant, which is the electron charge divided by something, I forget. <laughs> but, um, it's a quantity of great interest to the what? physicists. It's a quantity of great interest to physicists, the fine structure constant. Okay, but this, uh, there's a non-commutative geometry model for this. It's essentially due to Bellassard. So I've sort of tweaked it in different ways, but uh, he, uh, so this, uh, so you have uh, algebra of observables which is, uh, so the Hamiltonian is exactly like what I wrote down here. Hamiltonian for this process? Yeah, process. exactly. But, and then you form an algebra of observables from this uh, Hamiltonian. So typically in quantum theory, the algebra of observables is, are functions of the Hamiltonian, continuous functions of the Hamiltonian. That's a commutative c star algebra, but in this case, uh, you do not know the potential V and the potential V is periodic, so for different potentials, you'll get a non-commutative algebra of observables. So it turns out to be, people have studied it, and it's uh, actually Morita equivalent to this algebra which I wrote down, this twisted cross-product algebra. Okay, so the thing is uh, that uh, you have to know, so the conductance is only defined on the algebra of observables, and those consist, so the conductance is integral if its value, it's a sort of, uh, not a trace, but a higher trace, a cyclic two trace on this algebra of observables. And this, uh, so one has to show that it's integral, and what does that mean? This uh, cyclic two cycle on projections in the algebra are integers, okay, so, and that's, uh, in order to prove that, you use, uh, you establish a non-commutative uh, index theorem. Uh, you, you use a Fredholm operator to show that that co-cycle, and the churn character of that Fredholm co-cycle is uh, this uh, uh, conductance co-cycle. 
So that's the non-community geometry model. It uses the gaps. So it's the same language that you mm -hmm. have as new. Yeah, you have a higher cycle. A new character called the, the conductance or something. Yeah, you conductance. Element in an algebra? No, it's a cocycle on co -cycle. the algebra. Oh, new co higher cocycle. Yeah, it's the same algebra, but uh, not a zero cocycle. The trace is a zero cocycle. You take a two cocycle, oh. right? And, and that. Uh, you have to show that it's integral. So integrality means its values on projections, its integers. These cocycles are for the cohomology of this abelian group with coefficients and the functions? Uh, so this is cyclic cohomology. Cyclic cohomology of so it's, algebra. Yeah, of that algebra, oh. yeah. Uh, it's a tad complicated, but <laughs> nonetheless, well, it makes sense, actually. Yeah. Now that allows it to not be monotone. Your guy was monotone. Yeah, this is, is this is the, exactly. And uh, the trace is not integral, whereas this cyclical cycle is integral. So that's what uh, I mean. Pelissard had one way of proving it, and then we challenged ourselves to do it on the hyperbolic plane. We had to come up with more invariant ways of doing it than what he did. Yeah. Well, just to just a bit of gossip. I mean, at these seminars, yeah. these, se these workshops, so on. One of them, uh, you know, the famous string theorists that used higher dimensional gaze theory. You know, Witten and Seiberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were kind of lurking around because, you know, this stuff seems to be very active and. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly why. But. So they have a different approach to all this. They use string theory models for the fractional oh, effect. They have, an alternative approach. they have an alternative approach, but its starting point is uh, like Chen Simons. So they use that. So the Chen Simons 3D is kind of like the boundary is the 2D thing. The, the whole effect is 2D, two dimensional. So this is kind of a high dimensional analog. So you, yeah, but it's the real Hall effect is two dimensional. And they use Chen Simon's 3D to, and the boundaries, the 2D space. Uh, it's, it doesn't, uh, it's, it, it's independent of Belisard's model, <laughs> let's put it that way. So it's a corner field theory, a mean field theory model, which is Chen Simon's.